All right, our next and final speaker for this morning is Donna August. Uh, Donna, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name properly, but if I am mispronouncing it, that means I'm also mispronouncing the name of your research group. Um, so I hope that you'll clarify me if, I, if I'm getting that mistaken. Uh, and Donna's gonna be talking to us about valuing expertise from the people we serve. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, terrific. Uh, and I believe you all are going to put my slides up on the screen. All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Roy, and thank you for thank you community for inviting me to be here and to participate. I've been thoroughly enjoying the conversations and interactions and presentations uh, yesterday and today and looking forward to more. And I'm just very happy to be here learning a tremendous amount. In fact, last night I sat down and modified my presentation based on some of the things I learned yesterday, as one of the other presenters said this morning, too. It's an ongoing learning process and I appreciate it. So as, as Rory mentioned, I'm gonna speak about value, valuing expertise from the people we serve. And yes, you did pronounce my name correctly, Roy. It's my last name is August. Uh, and I am the founder of August Research Group based in Oceanside, California, which is near San Diego. And my email address is Donna at augustresearchgroup.com. And I encourage anyone who wants to reach out to me with questions or discussion beyond the setting of this week to do so. So my slides just disappeared from the screen. Maybe you all can bring them back. Um, so on the first slide, the one that's coming back here in a moment, there's uh, I included a picture of myself and there's alt text describing me there as well. So I'm an African-American woman. I'm 62 years old. I have brown skin, eyeglasses. And in this photo, I have a pre-quarantine short afro. And uh, I just I describe myself and, and include that description uh, with and include the photo in part because all of us here, I think, have a certain awareness of intersectionality and the fact that we bring various aspects of our backgrounds, experiences, knowledge and and lives to every interaction that we have. And so that gives you a, a little bit of a visual of me. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of my other other aspects of my background. Uh, and experiences as we go on in the presentation. We go to the next slide, second second slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to talk about three projects and the slide will catch up in just a second. The three projects are called, uh, first, Art Attention Arcade. Thank you very much. Uh, the second one is Notify Me, and the third one is Data Science for All. And these are all projects that August Research Group is involved in working with different folks in different communities. Next slide, please. So the first one, Attention Arcade. And for this project, we're doing some consulting with a company in San Diego called BrainLeap Technologies. And BrainLeap Technologies has, has looked at the challenge of, of how, how might we help children strengthen their attention skills. And behind that challenge is, is the question of well, why do children's attention skills need strengthening or some children's attention skills need strengthening. In some cases, it is because they have ADHD or, or attention challenges uh, that are, that are um, diagnosed, that have been identified. In some cases, they're well understood, or in some cases, they're some, somewhat understood. Some of the children that we've interacted with to understand attention skills ha are, have autism spectrum disorder or on the spectrum and have challenges that go along with um, their autism spectrum disorder. In some cases, there are undiagnosed reasons. Learning disabilities, um, maybe parents or children think that there may be ADHD or ASD, um, but, but that hasn't been evaluated by a professional. In some cases, the children are disengaged from the learning process or they're easily distracted. So there are a variety of reasons that attention skills need, need strengthening. Next slide, please. Two of the founders of, of two of the three founders of Brain Loop Technologies are neuroscience researchers at UC San Diego, Dr. Jeannie Townsend and Dr. Leanne Chukowski. They've done extensive research, extensive neuroscience research over in the case of Dr. Townsend, 30, 30 years, in the case of Dr. Chukowski, over 20 years. 
And working together, they've identified a number of methods for tracking eye movements to measure attention. So working with sighted children, they identified a number of areas of, of gaze control to assess and to train with, with the sighted children uh, in the age range of, of seven to 14 years old. The specific areas that they work with for assessing and for training are looking at fast shifts of attention, inhibitory control, and anticipat anticipatory focus. And I included a reference here, citation for one of their published papers from 2018. Next slide, please. So what community does this serve? Who does this serve? It serves children with attention challenges. And it's extremely important to the, the team at BrainLeap Technologies and, and to the work that we're doing with them that the children's expertise is valued in the process of designing ways for strengthening their attention skills. So the team did pilot research and interviews with children, and that led to identifying an interest in, on the children's part in having a gamified approach to attention training. So the team designed gaze-controlled video games. The children can have fun playing the games while they're training their attention. They play the games with their eyes instead of with a game controller or a mouse. And this is a novel approach, so there's some fun in that. But also the children, some of the children describe it as it's like having a superpower. And they like the fact that they can control the games by just using their eyes. This slide, the next slide, has six of the attention arcade screens. So the, this, these screens and the images show six of the games that are included in the arcade. And each of the games now has an alt text description. Thank you for the reminders that that was important for me to include. And while I won't go through each of the descriptions, what I'll say collectively about the games is that they use that they are gaze controlled video games and they use different interactive and playful gamified techniques for challenging the children to advance their skills and for assessing and monitoring how they do that in the following ways. The games are in different in different ways emphasizing fast and accurate shifts of attention by having the children move their eyes quickly to look at a target rapidly while it's moving across the screen inhibitory control so that there are distracting targets that pop up say on the periphery or edges of the screens and those distracting targets are to be ignored by the children with their plane while it, while they're playing instead having the children focus on the on the items that are the most important items to be controlled in order to win points in the game the games include a challenge of holding a steady fixation of gaze holding the children, holding their eyes steadily on a target for a certain length of time in order to gain their points in that game. Others have a visual search in a crowded field, rapidly being able to pick out and select certain items that have high point valuation compared to other items that have low point or negative values. And ignoring moving distractions. That's part of the inhibitory control, but also a very specific aspect of having those distractions be in motion and still having the child have sufficient attention skill to be able to ignore that. And when, they, when they're able to do that, their eyes are locked on certain targets that have high point gain. And so those are the kinds of systems that are set up in this gamified application to improve attention skills. Let's go to the next slide, please. So the next example that I'll give of work that we've been doing is notify me. So this is an early stage research and development pro project. And in this project, we're examining urban and workplace sounds in environments where people cannot hear well. The data set that we're developing, the initial data set work that we're doing is being sponsored by, in part, by the Association for Computing Machinery, the Special Interest Group on Computer Human Interaction. And in, in doing this work, we're, we're 
collaborating with deaf and hearing users and having both having individuals from both those communities work together. We're defining and identifying context dependent significant sounds. And when I use the term significant sounds, it's pretty likely that you may you may think, well, OK, wait, significant that there's a word there that can be defined in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. And that's exactly what we want. We want different individuals to be able to define what's significant about the sounds that are happening in the environment around them and raise awareness for, to that individual when those significant sounds occur in real time. So our system that we're still in the early stages of, of designing and, and defining will notify both deaf and hearing users of significant sounds based on their own definition of significance. And they'll do that notification or the system will do that notification via haptic and visual indicators on wrist wearable devices. And some examples of those devices include devices such as the Neosensory Buzz and various smartwatches. Next slide, please. So in this in this situation, who are the experts? Where where are we valuing expertise from? We're valuing expertise again from the people who we serve, the people who we hope to have benefit from this, this intervention, intervention that we're designing. So for example, one of the sources of expertise for Notify Me is a deaf adult who has been deaf for many years. And this person has expertise on staying safe and communicating effectively in environments where people cannot hear. And I wanna emphasize that that because this deaf adult who has been deaf for many years has developed over time enormous expertise in staying safe and communicating in these environments. When we're now looking at these environments for a different reason, for, for a specific reason, say a noisy workplace, and how does work get done safely and with effective communication, this deaf person who has that expertise is needed for us to do this work well. Another source of expertise for this project is a hearing adult who has experience in working in noisy workplaces, such, such as industrial workplaces or driving in a loud truck environment. And they have expertise about which sounds are important for their safety and for communication. And when we combine the expertise from those two sources, we have something that neither could give us independently, but both can give us together. So this co-design co effort specifically disallows a deficit model. Very consciously, we disallow that model because deaf expertise is needed for this R&D to proceed well. And in, in a deficit model, the deaf expertise may be overlooked or discounted, but in this case, it's elevated and it's extremely important for the success of the project. Next slide, please. So here's a, here's a photo of a person working in a noisy workplace. This person is, is, um, is wearing headphones in that noisy workplace to protect their ears. In a noisy workplace, sometimes people are wearing headphones to listen to music while they're working. So it could be for safety reasons, could be for entertainment, could be to reduce the tedium of the job. But in, in, the, in those examples, this person who can hear is now wearing headphones that obscure what they can hear. And so the Notify Me system is being designed with the expertise of the deaf workers and the hearing workers in this noisy workplace example for the use of both of them. Both categories of workers would receive notifications about significant sounds in the workplace. Next slide, please. The third project that we're working on, this is one that we recently have, have joined the team for. We're doing some consulting with Correlation One. And Correlation One is, is a, um, a company that does a, a variety of data science and data analytics consulting for clients who are, who are growing their businesses based on highly leveraged use of data, the data that's relevant to their business. A lot of businesses these days can't find enough folks with data science experience to fill open positions. It's a growing field. 
there are a variety of different roles from entry level all the way up to to highly experienced roles. And finding enough folks who are both interested in the field and skilled in the field is a challenge for some of the clients that Correlation One works with. And so they decided a few years ago to start efforts toward identifying people who have interest in data science and bringing them into data science uh, training programs and um, opportunities for employment. One of the programs that they are doing is they call Data Science for All is a three month certificate course on introductory data analytics. It's free to the participants and it's taught on Saturdays over the course of three months, very long Saturdays. I mean, very long days each Saturday, but for three months with the Saturday intensives as well as homework assignments and some group meetings that happen during the week in between the Saturday meetings, a cohort of students travels through this curriculum and learns introductory data analytics. The graduates are employment ready and the sponsors of the Data Science for All certificate courses are companies who are interested in employing, in employing people in these roles, including entry level folks. And so it's a good, it's a very good match for the sponsors and the graduates of the cohort to be able to look at possible employment matches. The Correlation One team set out to specifically focus on building diverse cohorts through partnerships with various communities of practice. So for example, they partnered with the uh, National Society of Black Engineers and um, other organizations so that they can specifically reach out into communities that are underrepresented in data science and other areas of STEM. This cohort that started in the fall of 2020 had over 8,000 applicants and they could only choose 500 because that was the size of the plan for this cohort. Um, they're hoping to grow the program and expand it as time goes on. This diverse 500 student cohort is 53% female, 3% other in terms of gender and self-identification and 44% male. Other examples of diversity in this specific cohort, 16% LGBTQ+, 30% Latinx, 50% Black, and it also includes applicants who self-identified as in, in other areas of underrepresented communities, so such as immigrants, people from low-income backgrounds, people with disabilities, or first-generation college students. Next slide, please. Part of what we are working with the Correlation One and the Data Science for All program to do is to collaborate with deaf communities to form the first Data Science for All deaf hard of hearing cohort for this program. This cohort will have 10 to 20 deaf or hard of hearing participants. This is for spring 2021. And people from deaf communities, such as the National Black Deaf Advocates, are helping us to prepare accommodations to make sure that we are we are trying to um, do our best to help this first cohort to both be successful themselves and to help us to pave the way for more deaf and hard of hearing participants to join future cohorts going going forward. We're developing ASL signs for data science. Those will be available open access and we're recruiting deaf teaching assistants as part of the team. Next slide, please. And then this is the last slide. So these three projects all have a common thread. Focus on value and expertise from the people we serve. Our R&D is, is done in such a way that we incorporate expertise from the users into the design. We value the lived experiences of the users. It's not just the formal experiences, knowledge and training, but also the lived experiences that may not be through formal channels. We welcome all the users' knowledge and we begin our work with users' input. In all of those ways and a number of other ways, we, we strive to demonstrate and to, to actually implement the, the value, valuing of expertise from the people who we serve. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Donna. What what great and inspiring work uh, that you're able to to take on. Um, we have a couple of questions for you and comments. Um, one question asks, and I, I think this was about um, the arcade slides that you were sharing. Uh, does it require a special eye gazer device, or is this available on webcam devices like iPhone? That's a good question. It does require a special device, and in fact, this is a device. I don't know if you guys can, if you all can see this. So yeah. this is this is an eye tracker from a company called Toby, third party. It's a USB device, plugs into a um, uh, USB port on a Windows computer, Windows computer, and uh, the eye tracking. Uh, is um, is done in, by this device in conjunction with our software. Great. Um, we have a comment from Shireen Hafez, uh, who's the founder of Deaf Codes Kids, and said that uh, they'd be happy to collaborate with you. Wonderful. Uh, Absolutely wonderful. We have another question. Um, with such a high graduation rate from the DS4A program, what have been the indicators for a successful transition to employment? Uh, that's a very good question. So as you can imagine, the Correlation 1 team is, is big on data, you know, collecting data about the, the, the each cohort, how, it how, they, how the cohort travels through the curriculum and uh, placement into jobs, as well as retention. So retention is key, and retention has is multifaceted. It's uh, not just sort of time and position after joining a company, but it's also satisfaction and fulfillment in the in the role in the job with opportunities for growth and continued career development. So all of those are the kinds of metrics that the team monitors and seeks to continue to have feedback from with each cohort as they graduate and move into various data science roles and will continue to as well. So this cohort, this diverse cohort of this fall that just started in October, um, will be completing their 13 weeks because we don't meet over a couple of holiday weeks. Uh, they'll com be completing their 13 weeks at the beginning of February. And so at that point, many of them will move into new positions and we'll be keeping track of that data and seeing how well we do in retention and job satisfaction. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like that's all the questions that we have for Donna. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for sharing um, your work. Uh, as I said, it's it's really, really great stuff. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, and so it looks like we're gonna be finishing a few minutes early, uh, so that will give people a few more minutes to stretch their legs. Um, hopefully we'll see all of you back here in your uh, breakout group. You should have the proper link for those breakout groups in your calendar or have received an email from MSR events or Janus about the breakout groups. Uh, so uh, enjoy your, your short break um, and please join us and join your breakout groups back here at 1045 Pacific time. Thanks.